Welcome to In Conversation. If you are an actor or anybody interested in this profession, alert all of your friends. We'll be taking questions from Facebook. Greetings to our studio in Australia, where it is 7 a.m. on Sunday morning. Ooh. <laughs> and I expect you're up, and you've got great questions to send in as well. We'll be taking questions from the live audience, as well as from Facebook. I met Jim Belushi over 25 years ago. Oh my God, was that a long ago? At my first studio, my postage stamp size studio. Oh, yeah, Robert, yeah, yeah, yeah. Robertson. I want to say uh, a few things about him that you may not know from a, a personal point of view. During the years that I directed benefit concerts, Oh, those were fun. <laughs> I would call Jim and I would say, I'm directing a benefit, and he would say, when, where, what do you need me to do? And when he came in, and this is how you know who somebody really is, when he came in to work with the musicians, first of all, they loved you because you are a musician as well, but he also found a way for everybody to have a featured moment. And you made everyone you work with feel wonderful and feel empowered and feel uplifted. During the years that you were doing According to Jim, your own series, you would call me and say, who do we have from the home team? We've got some roles coming up. Let's try to give somebody a break. So yes. One time when he was walking in to According to Jim, Joseph Bologna oh, God, he's so good. was in the waiting room being kept waiting. And you took him into your office and you said, you don't treat Joseph Bologna that way. Oh, no, I just cast him. Look, what are you doing? Auditioning yeah. Joseph the Bologna for the brain of the Just cast him. <laughs> that is an actor. My favorite out. year. I mean, he's in everything. He was the greatest. Uh, geez. I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed. But you, you fixed that, Jim. Oh, yeah. He was terrific in the episode, too. Fixed that. I was only going to have agents, managers, and casting directors for this series. But this past December, we were about to have the Charlie Brown Christmas class. Everybody had already left town. There were only a few people here, almost no work. <laughs> and instead of a lump of coal, who shows up to sit in on class but Jim Belushi? And I said, Jim, make some comments with me. And not only did you, but you shared such insight and the students were on the edge of their seat. And I thought, oh, this is too good to pass up. We need to have him. And once again, I asked for something. And once again, it was, OK, when, where, and I'll be there. So I want you to know this is a journeyman who has achieved so much in his career. If you haven't seen his performance in Wonder Wheel, do it. It's Oscar worthy. He's got so many new things, including a new series coming up. And he's taken his time to come here and share his expertise. And we are delighted to have you, Mr. Jim Belushi. Well, thank you. Our first question comes from our voice director, David Corey. <coughs> and, he says, <laughs> and he says, what do you wish you had known starting out? you didn't know? Uh, well, uh, that it's uh, never as bad as you feel it's going to be. Uh, I wish I would have known. You know, a director once told me when I, when I started the sitcom, uh, and he did all of uh, Tim Allen's shows, and I was doing a movie for him, and I said, oh, master, tell me what I should do. No, before I enter into the sitcom world, so give me one piece of advice. And he said, never, never worry on Monday, because the script will be different by Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of the thing that I wish I would have known, because I'm always worried. I'm worried about interviews coming out. I'm worried about being vulnerable, really. Uh, and I'm still that way. So I'm, even though I know it, it's still, I still suffer from that vulnerability because what we do is you know we open ourselves and show ourselves and and uh, it's frightening it's frightening this is from also faculty member Marilyn McIntyre again it's a starting out question is there anything in terms of the business itself 
handling business, handling representation, anything that you would have done differently? Well, differently? Um, no, I, you know, business-wise, money-wise, being an actor, you know, you go from job to job and you just learn to be frugal and manage your money and I've always been on top of, of the managing my living and how to live and stuff. I've never, still to this day, you know. I mean, this was free, this was free. You would be my Todd, JP Todd, free jeans from the last movie. This, this, this was a gift. This felt a lovely gift. So, uh, but I got cash in my pocket. <laughs> uh, but I think that's a really important point. Because... Well, I know you got to really watch it. You yeah. can't. You can't. And, and when the success comes and the money comes, I, I still look at it that way, and, and I get criticized for it. But it's just it's just a natural way of existence to to live. Uh, what was the other part of the question? The well, it, it, oh, agents and managers yeah. and stuff like that. Um. You gotta have a nice relationship with them. You gotta stay on them. Uh, and the main thing is to, to develop a relationship with them. Uh, I had a problem uh, when I was at CAA, uh, 14 years. Uh, my agent didn't know my son's first name, which was the most important thing in my life to me at that time. Didn't know his birthday, didn't know, you know. And the, the theory there was if you uh, don't smell them, sell them. So they'll sell you out in a heartbeat unless you get in a relationship with them. And then, uh, then they just don't have the nerve <laughs> to sell you out. And so when I moved agencies and managers, you know, my manager's really funny. He still sends my son a birthday card. <laughs> you know, he's 37, you know. Uh, because I sat down with him at lunch one time. I said, to, well, what's my son's name? And he went, oh, oh, I know what it is. It's uh, uh, Terry. Terry? Uh, t t t Robert. You know where he lives? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Michigan, Ohio, Chicago. I said, Mark, you know, we got to have a relationship if you want to represent me. And I have a beautiful relationship with him and my agent now. And they turned down more work for me that I would turn down because their interest in me is at their heart, not the money, because they love me and I love them. So with agents, you know, get to know them, get to know their families, get to know what they do, let them, and you develop a real relationship and then you're working together. So that's what I would say about them. You know, they're, they're people too and uh, they got other clients and, uh, you know, they won't sell you out if they love you. Great. We're taking questions from the live audience, also from Facebook. Please let everybody you know about this wonderful opportunity to gain this insight. This is a question from somebody in the room. Patrick Brescia, where are you? Okay, Sam. How do you stay focused and positive in between projects? Well, I, 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 uh, I, I'm, I'm fortunate because uh, I've created other businesses. I have a, a band called the Sacred Hearts, and we did a lot of corporate events and casinos. I do the Blues Brothers with Dan Aykroyd. We do a lot of corporate events, benefits, and casinos. And about six, seven years ago, I started with my son a uh, improvisational group. And so we've been on that year. We did fifty shows. Um, so I do improv shows, do music, uh, and so it keeps it keeps me you know, dancing. It keeps the, the performance alive, the communication and the the intimacy with audiences alive and the spontaneity. That's what helps me. Um, I often tell people take classes. Stay in the class, stay in the class, stay in the study, stay, keep getting in front of people, just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. Just stay in classes and do anything. I, I mean, you know, with the exception of porn, you know, I would do anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
would do corn if I was built blow. <laughs> but you know, just do anything. That's I mean, otherwise it's really hard. It's really hard. It's really hard. It's you know, my poor daughter, she's eighteen, she just went to NYU Tish and she's studying, you know, and really study hard. They're they really are tough on them. And I love what she what I'm hearing. But she starts complaining about the actor she's working with. And I'm listening to all the words she's using, right? And I'm listening, she's going on how he doesn't show up and he doesn't do this and he doesn't do that and he's not connecting with me and he's not looking at me and he's this and that. I said, okay, okay. I said, now let's go to the character. Let's des describe the character to me and the relationship. She does and I go, okay, so you realize what you just described about the character is exactly what's going on between you and the actor, right? Am I doing nothing without even knowing it? <laughs> I said, that is a real problem. And as you get older, you'll be able to separate the two. Uh, it's painful. What we do, it's painful. Now, the way out of it, um, I, you know, there's two things my brother John told me that, that are really, one I've mastered and one I'm still working on. Uh, the one I've mastered was when I was at Second City, an improvisational theater, there was a company of seven or eight of us. And he came and saw the show. And, you know, I thought it was pretty good. You know, I was good. And, That's uh, amazing for him to say. Yeah, I, uh, yeah it is. Imagine you know, really I'm not real happy about my work. Because he doesn't say that. He's no, but it was pretty good. And uh, he watched one set. And he's, afterwards he said, how come you didn't work with those three people? I said, what? He goes, well, those other three people, how come you didn't work with them? I said, well, you know, they're, you know, they're kind of young, they're, you know, they're not so good at it, you know, I really kind of have fun with the other three, you know? And he said, your job is not to work with those three. Your job is to work with those three. Your job is to make that weaker actor a stronger actor. Your job is to make that actor look great. Because if he looks great, then you look great. But the most important thing is that the scene looks great, and then the show will be great. Mm -hmm. I'm like, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the essence of ensemble. And the job was to get out of yourself and get into the other actor, whatever they need, whatever you get, you pump them, you give them a little back, you give them a little space, you know, make sure their light is okay. You love them, you know? And that changed my whole way of acting and the way I approach actors and how I work. And it's really much more fun to be in love mm. with your actors, you know? I mean, sister love, you know? It's very important that you treat actresses as um, just people and you can love them deeply you know you just can't cross any lines you know but you can but if you don't cross lines you can actually go into a deeper love and mm -hmm. communication with like Courtney Thorne Smith and according to Jim I mean oh god I love that girl the most beautiful girl in the world and that you couldn't even look in her eyes she was so beautiful but if you Look at as an actor and an actress and a human, you, you know, you, you can have, express that love in the scene. The other thing he taught me was, um, was there's this place called, um, oh, what's the name of the place? The Grill, um, Goat, Billy Goat, Billy Goat Tavern in Chicago. It was under the, under the road and it's a, Funky bar was right where Sun Times and the, and the Chicago Tribune were, and all the writers were there, and they were all drunks, you know. And, uh, and they were. I mean, those writers were drunks. Mike Ryko hung out there. And I don't know if you know who he is, but anyway, they had cheeseburgers there. And when John did cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger on TV, uh, this guy put a sign up and said, Cheeseburger, 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 John Belushi, SNL. Right? But he got the idea from him. Well, John was alive at the time, and I said, John, I said, this guy is like, I mean, 
he's, he's totally ripping you off. <laughs> because the cheeseburger thing came from my father and my uncle. They had a place called Olympia Lunch at Logan Square. And he was actually doing a cross between my uncle and my dad. And I said, this guy just totally ripped you off. And he said, and he wouldn't have taken it if he didn't need it. And just moved right on. I went, wow, man. <laughs> and that one is the hard one to live with. You know what I mean? It's really hard to do that. Whether it's with another actor, they're taking something from you. Well, you know, they wouldn't take it if they didn't need it. And I can give it. Because I have it. What an excuse. What well, okay, that's that one I still, it's like, the guy cut me off on, on, on the road here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he wouldn't have taken it if he didn't need it. Jesus. <laughs> this will be lighter. This is from Paula Fairbrother. Okay, thanks for being here. What's your favorite Howard story teaching moment? <laughs> <laughs> I stuck with you. Oh, dear. Paula, thank you. <laughs> Sitting in that office with him with a script and and uh, gang related. By the, by the time we got to page thirty, he was like, "You got it." And uh, he just and just we went through the rest of the script. Uh, he just. I think your punctuation story too. That one I still use. It, 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 I, I teach that, by the way, when I do master classes. Stuff. You I wouldn't have taken story. it if you didn't I need it. Have, I, needed it. <laughs> <laughs> I needed it. I needed to say something. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm in comedy. You steal. You know. <laughs> the other punctuation story just changed my life, uh, and I did it with my son and my daughter. And you know the punctuation stuff, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Read the goddamn sentence to this period, will you? Don't break it up. And say it in your mind to keep it. it, it that really changed my life. I don't think I said it that harshly. <laughs> I, read the goddamn See, thing. now you heard You it. are a little rough in that room now. Come on, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you get a little bossy in there. <laughs> you get a little rough on All me. right, it's even true. Me, even me. He's rough on me. But it's I, true. But he does it in love. I do so it in you love. hear it. You hear it. Like, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No one does any good to anyone if they're not real. Oh, no. And that's what's extraordinary about you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you're real. You. Yeah. Uh, this is Michael Underwood. Where are you? Howard. Oh, there. There you are. Hi, Jim. I've noticed a maturity occurs with actors as once they have kids as if something has shifted. Did you notice that after having children? <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you the shift. I gotta make some goddamn money. <laughs> I got a goddamn kid I gotta pay for. I'll tell you what shifts. Jeopardy shifts. And, 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 and the maturity becomes fake maturity to keep the goddamn job. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you the maturity. But an actor, you gotta, you know, it's like a kid. <laughs> yeah. I think maturity just comes with experience and age, and I'm still learning. The last thing I did was such a joy to work on was a thing called Salvage for ABC, North, North Carolina, or South Carolina. And it was, uh, it was a joy because all the actors were adults. Mm -hmm. And it was so... Nice. It was fun. It was fun. Just pros, you know. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cross over here. I'm gonna. Try, I'm gonna I think I'm gonna try to cross over here and, and throw the cup. Yeah, sure. Yeah, whatever you need, Jim. Oh, great. Anything you need? Well, I don't like. Oh, it's just like. Whoa! I love working with pros and adults. You know, it's fun. Who aren't threatened by an actor? Yeah, I mean, up. because the maturity. <laughs> what the maturity does is it's. You're not as scared. You're not as scared to give it away. You know, you're not so worried about the narcissist. You know, it's the working of that ensemble thinking constantly. And some people don't receive it well. They don't know. They weren't trained. You know, they're, they're, I call them vampires. <laughs> well, they'll suck the air out of a scene and not give you room and take the breath away and move during your important lines. And they're just like vampires. 
And that is a nightmare to work with. I've got a few tricks to help with that, but uh, it wouldn't take it if they didn't need it, I guess. <laughs> That's the theme of the but day. I've had some hard times, hard times with the with actors and actresses that don't uh, don't understand the concept of relationship. It's only the relationship with themselves and the camera. Kim Kim Cattrall has a thing with her in uh, Wild Palms years ago, years and years ago. I remember. Yeah, that. yeah. And uh, we were shooting a two-person scene overs and stuff, and you know, I, I see her looking into the camera and looking at her hair all the time, and it's just, you know, I'm not hearing anything I'm saying, I felt like I was, and I said, you know, it's really hard for me to do this scene with you if you if you don't know, kind of look at me at least, you know? I mean, you're very much more concerned about the camera angle in your hair than what's going on between us. Well, people work differently. <laughs> I got six more weeks for this one, right? <laughs> I blew it. I'm telling you, years later, I get a letter from her. A long letter explaining to me about that moment and how it changed her career and how she went back in New York to study uh, Stella and go back to her craft. And she was so grateful that I said that to her. And then the next thing I know, she was on Sex and the City. Right? Well, that's so, yeah. But it's like, you know, <laughs> you and me, baby. It's just a dance. <laughs> We're just dancing. <laughs> Let's dance. We're taking questions from the live audience from Facebook. Please share the page. Please like it. Love it. What's not to love? Speaking of chemistry, you had amazing chemistry with Kate Winslet. Oh my God, what so a thoroughbred. Oh, she was terrific. <laughs> <laughs> she is the scariest person I've ever met. <laughs> oh my God, she was, uh, uh, I, I told this story in class. When I walked on the set of uh, Wonder Wheel, there was Woody Allen, there was Kate, and there was a Victorio. Uh, who was the DP, and Woody Allen had like, I don't know, like 28 Academy Awards floating over his head, <laughs> nominations, and I could see the ghosts. <laughs> and then Kate had another like, you know, five nominations and awards, and Vittorio has got like three, I mean, he did, he did Last Tango in Paris, for Christ's sake, this guy. Bertolucci, all of Bertolucci's, and I got, uh, a, a certificate <laughs> of an Emmy nomination for writing on Saturday Night Live that I shared with 17 other writers. <laughs> and we didn't win. <laughs> so I, metaphorically, you know, I folded that up, put this in one pocket, Put my dad in this pocket, put my brother John in this pocket. How do you do? I'm Jim Belushi. It's nice to meet you. And so I just pulled myself up. Oh, I got a trick. Uh, Anthony Quinn taught me this trick. You know who Anthony Quinn is over the Greek? <laughs> He's the dancer. I did a movie with him, and he came up to hear on me. Right? Same thing with Arnold, by the way. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Really? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know, Anthony, my God, I thought you were so big. You know, I play these big characters, Zorba, you know, you know and, uh, and with Sir Lawrence, I mean, with uh, Peter O'Toole, Lawrence of Arabia. And I said, you're so big. I said, how do you do it? And he goes, well, Jim, I visualize a little screw in my head with a little circle, like a little keyhole. And, I, and the ceiling is a pulley, and I throw the rope up over the pulley, and I hook it onto my head, and the rope is right here, and before I go on, I just pull the rope. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm telling you, when I went to see Kate, I just went, 
Hello, I'm Jim Belushi. <laughs> it really works. <laughs> anyway, she was wonderful to work with. She's a very well-studied uh, actress. She's a, a extremely, extremely focused, and it's all about focus acting. And she had just a higher intensity of focus than me, even, although I faked it quite a while. Um, she was, uh, we ran lines in the car and went home because she had an enormous amount of lines. Um, she was uh, a thoroughbred. Um, if I was, I, I went in like, okay, let's do the scene. I had to be so grounded and so ready because if, if I wasn't, she would have just walked right over me and knocked me over. And not in a bad way, it's just like, you know, you gotta, you gotta stand up to me, baby, or I'm, I'm running right through you. I ain't letting this scene die. So I had to really have force back, and I had to be really prepared, and I really had to be focused. And she was actually kind of delighted. I could see it in her eye. Like, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about you. <laughs> right? You'll cover your side of the scene. I don't have to worry about your, you've done your work. I don't have to worry about it so I can worry on my shit. You know? She, uh, <laughs> we had a little race to the set. I, I watched Streetcar Named Desire twice because there was, the script felt like street, Streetcar to me. It was on a, it had a long set, the set was similar, a lot of different rooms. We were in the set for a long time, long 10 page scenes. The scene toward the end where she kind of loses it was reminiscent of, you know, Blanche. And so I watched it. And I came up with a little study of my own that, what, what if Stanley at the end of that movie, what if Stanley at the end of the movie, he, you know, he grabs his wife, Stella, and she's pregnant. And he puts his head, okay, and that's the end of the movie. Well, what if Stella had that baby, and it was 25 years later, where would they be? And she dies, Stella. And, you know, the Brando character was in, deeply in love. So I kind of took that as my metaphor in that movie, and I made... I made the daughter, the, that daughter, and she looked like Stella. And so I, I, I kind of did that with her. But the other thing that's really interesting about seeing that movie was the, the physical work in the movie. If you ever watch it again, there isn't a moment, but no, no, like, there are a few moments actually, where Brando's still. And he chose those moments really carefully. The rest of the time, Everything was moving. It's <clears throat> actor oh, studio. Actor studio. Yeah. Moving all your all your emotions, everything that's going on is you know, Paul Sills, everything is expressed in object work. Yes, did you hear that? <laughs> Go on. It's all expressed in object work, right? So I get to the set early, right? Because I'm starting to work my I'm starting to do my object work. I did it in my homework, what I could do, but now I see the set, so I have to adjust to it. She was there five minutes before me. <laughs> she took the goddamn kitchen away from me. She was in there with the plates and the this and I'm like, shit! I'm on this side of the bar, there's only stools, there's some stuff up here. I gotta go around there to get to the refrigerator. <clears throat> so, uh, each day we would try to beat each other at the set for the next scene to see who could do the, the steal the physical work. She, she was cute. I mean, you know, it was healthy, fun competition, wasn't it? But the minute you're using things, you're living, yeah? Well, sure. I mean, there was, I mean, I got stuck in the middle of that living room for a long period of time. And oh, I was like, God damn it, I can't get any objects going on. I created that whole thing where I asked for a drink, I ad lived it, and I pushed everything over so then I could shift my attitude as I was picking it up, so it helped with that transition. Then going back to the daughter, there was a lot of shifting going on, you know? 
So I did that, but there was still this moment that I realized, I started thinking, and my dad used to have a handkerchief all the time. All the time, he, he, it was an old cloth, a cloth even, you know, from a restaurant or something, and he, he'd always be wiping the side of his mouth, putting it back, or wiping here, putting it back. I went, got it. Like I said, I had my dad in my pocket, right? He came out with a handkerchief. So I had, I had this handkerchief to help me with my object work. And it grounded me and saved Because me. a smart actor looks for reasons to have things, not for reasons not to. Yeah, no, no. Otherwise, you're doing TV and it's all just, you know. And they, people do that very well. It's just, you know, procedural stuff where you just kind of just talk and you look good and you talk. But the theater of it is, you know, you have to, they have to find the object work. So for me, it's ensemble, love the one you're with. Ensemble object work. Great. We're taking questions from the studio audience here, from Facebook Live. I hope from the studio in Australia. Uh, this is from Miki Yamashita, who's right here. In multi-camera sitcom, an actor performs simultaneously for cameras and a live audience. Is there anything specific advice you have about multi-cam for these actors who are accustomed to performing in live theater or single camera? Yes. <laughs> That's for the crowd. It's so fun to sit down. It's so fun. It is theater. It is theater. Uh, you have a live audience. You're on a stage, a set, and they just have cameras in between. So you do it the same as theater. Um. You just have to be more conscious of the camera, that's all. I mean, but the truth is, if I'm looking at Howard like this, there's a camera right there picking it up anyway. So I'm kind of safe wherever I go. There's a master that has everything. There's a couple cameras like this, and there's one that kind of floats in a two shot. So you're covered. <laughs> you're just covered. So you just kind of do what you want. Some directors will try to get you to hit certain spots and hold because it makes it easier for them to set the camera. I was kind of a pain in the ass. I made them follow me all the time. You know, it's like, no, because you've got to keep movement because movement brings energy. And sitcoms are high energy, and you want to keep the energy going, you know, at least the type that we did. You know, I mean, they have a lot of sitcoms that they just sit and talk on the couch, too. And we've done that, too. But for the kind of Lucy, Gary Marshall style of, multi-cam where you have the big block comedy scenes and you have to bring energy to it. The only thing now you don't do anything. They're all doing it for you. <laughs> all you gotta do is love, 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 have a little smile and tease. Like we used to tease each other uh, on the show, you know. Like when there was a laugh, you know, when little Kimberly, she's so cute, Kimberly, she was so funny. But she, she'd get a big joke and we'd be standing there holding for the laugh and we'd be going, uh, cracked it, uh, you cracked that one. Right? We'd talk to each other during the laugh. Uh. Like, oh, not as good as we thought, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll do that in the next day. You know, I mean, we'd have these, we'd play with each other. Some actors flip up. Did you say something mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I was just playing around with it. Don't do that. He kind of throws me. Oh, okay, okay. You mean they'd have to be present for a moment? Well, they'd have to be present for a moment and look at me. <laughs> yeah. And that is one of the things that I do do, and that is I do throw them off a little bit. Other actors that come in so prepared. <laughs> that they can't move. We call that pre-shaped. Pre-shaped. It's like, oh, I'm going to shake this shit up. <laughs> it's so easy to do. They're so vulnerable when they do that. You're not present. I'm going to smack you upside the head so hard. <laughs> I mean, all I used to do was this, you know. Like, Peace, stink. <laughs> I mean, they'd be like, what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck, man? <laughs> so funny.
fun. Well done. You don't do it meanly, you do it for fun. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is from Joe Mahan. Where's Joe? There he is. Uh, Alec Baldwin said that being directed by Oliver Stone in the 80s was akin to being in a mosh pit at a heavy metal concert. Would you agree with this assertion of, and how did the role of Dr. Rock come to you? Did you feel safe in the filming locations? Well, Alec worked with Oliver after Platoon. So that was a different Oliver. I worked with Oliver after he did The Hand. <laughs> you know the movie The Hand? It was like a horror film. He didn't write it. And when we were working with Oliver and he'd start talking a little too much, go, wait, 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 wait. I think what the scene needs is a hand coming out like <laughs> Stop it, stop it, this is serious. We're in El Salvador. I know, but one hand. <laughs> so he was still someone you could fuck with. You know, but he was much more even, you know, with us, you know. Uh, it, it, it's, I wouldn't say mosh pit, but maybe, maybe kind of like a mosh pit. I've never really been in a mosh pit. Uh, but I've been uh, very confused, and he, he, he wants to keep you that way. Like in one scene when I was doing a Dr. Rock thing, I, you know, he would, he, first thing you do when you, they say cut is the first thing you do is you look up to the director, right? And you get up, or great, 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 or, you know, bring it down a little bit, let's do it again. Or that was that was good, but let's let's let's, let's tighten it up a little bit, or something. You get some reaction. You're the most vulnerable in that moment of cut. So they own you, and you turn it over. So I would look up at Oliver, and he'd go like this. <sighs> <laughs> Said so, I don't know what it was, but then he took me in the trailer. He goes, you know, it's okay to feel that way, Jim. Uh, you just can't talk to people like that in front of other people. I go, oh, I'm sorry. Because I embarrassed him. He's the director. You know, I might have said something like, you don't know what the fuck you want. You know? We can do that fight in the trailer. That's a fun fight. <laughs> so I said, okay, I get it. Sorry, my bad. So you can't do that either. <laughs> <laughs> Did I answer your question about yes, him? Okay. He'll fuck with you. There's guys that will fuck with you to get what they want. There's directors that let you, like Woody, just lets you do whatever you want. He expects you to come in with your bags, prepared, ready in character. There's no coaching going on. Come in, do it. You know, we do one, two, three takes sometimes. So whatever you can do, you do. But then he directed a little bit. He was like in the scene where I come in and yell at the kid. He said, he said, you know, you have you have a right. You really have a right to be mad. Of course, you should be very angry right now. But my my ear, 
It's a little, it hurts my ear a little bit. I said, you want me to bring it down? Yeah, yeah, bring it down. <laughs> okay, I can do that. I'll sit on it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, he'll, he'll protect you from your, your indulgence. You know? Well, you made us care about that character because you didn't judge it. Because if you look at some of the abusive behavior, it's easy to judge it. You didn't. Well, the script reads extremely abusive, uh, alcoholic, uh, rage. Uh, you know, he wasn't drinking, but raging. Uh, yeah. The script read one note job. It felt, when I read it, I was like, okay, this is a, uh, what I call the divisive character. They're using this character in order to push the story along. But the study, I made him more, I just made him more human. I just like, his name was Humpty. Okay, Woody called him Humpty for a reason. Humpty Dumpty fell on the wall, broken a thousand pieces. He's fragile. You don't want him to fall. He doesn't want to fall. What happens when you fall and you shatter? You go into what I call the abyss. We've all had that experience of free floating, well, it's trauma. And what is, what is trauma except for the complete loss of power and you can't get a hold of yourself? I've had many of those experiences in my life. And so this guy lost his wife and his daughter ran off and he went into abyss. And she, you know, my story, she found him on a goddamn bar floor drunk and they helped each other. So his biggest fear is the abyss. I can't go there, I can't go there. So, I, you know, I just kept deepening him, deepening him. And Humpty was also a big cannon used in the British battle in 1848. It was one of these huge, huge, huge cannons of the hole about this big, but the metal was like this. And they called it Humpty Dumpty because they had to get it up on the wall and it, and it fell off the wall and they, they lost the power of it. But it was like, you know, tons or something, you know. So the cannon, powerful, one big shot but could fall. So I did all those kinds of metaphors to try to humanize it. Well, you would go from the rage, but under the rage was always love. I love, I love, I love. I love, and, 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 I love and, 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 and I don't want to go to abyss. That's our deal, that's our deal, honey. That's our deal, remember? That's our deal, we saved each other. There was a scene that they cut. I helped you, I saved your life, and you saved my life, and I saved yours. And she went, mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, but I mean, it was, yeah, that, that was, the was deal. still there. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, this is from Ever Prashkolnik. Where are you? Okay. <clears throat> are you always as confident as you appear? And if not, how do you project confidence? I am always confident. <laughs> <laughs> I project it by telling you so. <laughs> confident. Uh, no, I'm not very confident. Of course not. How can you be confident when you need love? When you know you need love. Unless you have love, where, where's the confidence? So why am I an actor? I need love. And I get it from audiences. My need overrides all the technique. My technique gets me to the place for me to get what I need. And I wouldn't take it if I didn't need it. I need the love. And that's why I make a fool of myself or risk myself. So confidence? No. There's no confidence. There's no, no such thing as confidence. There's only temporary Denial and foolery. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that well said? We're taking questions from Facebook. Please like the page, share it, let all your friends know to tune in for this master advice. Profound advice. Now, this is from Lee John I just got Gilbert. sad about that. Yeah. I thought, because <laughs> it's true. Well, it is true. It's like, you know, you know the weakness in the character. 
that, you know, every scene is devoted to love. Not getting it, trying to get it, you know, reacting from not getting it, reacting from getting it, reacting from the fear of losing it, and the strategies you use to get love in any fucking scene. It all comes down to where is the love moving? You know. Now, how to act it is a different thing. But, but, you, but, but you also just you talk about vulnerability. You made yourself completely vulnerable to answer it that way. And that's the mark. Yeah. That's the mark. I'm a fool. <laughs> <laughs> the therapist once said to me, why do you make yourself so vulnerable? I do. I do. You make yourself vulnerable to people. I do. So, man, that's why I have agents and managers and stuff. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you got to drop. You got to drop into the belly of the fear. That's why I like playing lighter characters. Because you don't have to get so heavy. You know? I mean, I play, I did ball. Rex Ball at the Goodman Theater. What a nightmare of a character. The places I had to go. Even this Wonder Wheel, the places I had to go. Oh I'm God, so yeah. glad I was living alone in New York at the time. To keep myself from drinking every night was just like, you've got to go there. And we all have those places to visit. And we most of the time try to avoid those places, right? But when you act, you got to go there. And then you gotta like my told my daughter, you know, you'll get better at it. <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll be able to drop the character. You can't drop the character when you're doing drama. But comedy you can. Although do you remember the episode of According to Jim with Bologna? That was deep. And we were working on it, you said, This isn't funny, is it? And I said, No, it's not. <laughs> and you trusted it on the sitcom. Yeah, it's just like not it be. to be. It was heavy. I'm sure it did. hadn't seen his father in a long time. Writing's got to be really good to make that find a laugh in there. You got to really sew it. Yeah. Do we have questions from Facebook? Not yet. Send us your questions. Send them in. Yeah. We got tons of live questions. Where's Lee John Gilligan? Okay, over there. Uh, when did you decide that it was all or nothing when it came to acting? At what point did you commit 100%? Well, I don't know, it all happened by accident. You know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't prepare a speech for my speech class in high school. And I remember the date, it was October 16th because on October 15th was the first Vietnam Memo uh, Memo uh, Mem March. Memorial, I can't remember the word. And I'm, I'm literally walking down the hall going, I gotta deliver this speech, I gotta deliver this speech, I gotta deliver this speech, I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna talk about, I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna talk about. And they called me up and I just acted like a hippie that was at this march and yelled at everybody for not being there. <laughs> right? Yeah. Man, what were you doing, man? You sitting in your, your suburban home with your mama and your daddy. I'm out there in the streets, man. I'm fighting for our brothers and sisters. What are you doing, man? <laughs> right? And I got a D on the speech. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a new teacher, and he was doing his first one act. And he asked me to read for him that night. I said, well, I don't really read. He goes, well, can you tell a story? And I, so I told a story. And I got the part. So I was like, wow. And then I got the part. And what was great was there was a lot of girls there. <laughs> and I was a tackle in football. You know what a position tackle is? OK. The girls weren't dating the tackles. <laughs> they were dating the guys who touched the ball. So I was in this theater, and there's all these really nice girls, and I got dates. So I said, I like this. <laughs> and then I took choir. <laughs> I, I'm this macho football guy who's drinking on the weekends, doing acid, right? Smoking cigarettes, smoking pot, getting arrested. I'm like this tough guy. And then this, they wanted me to take Spanish, and I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do the Spanish. I got one draft Spanish. She goes, okay, well, then take choir. I just thought she was going to get me. I went, all right. 
there were 40 girls and eight guys. <laughs> and looked quiet. <laughs> they were all so nice. So then I learned to sing, and I learned to act, and I learned to do comedy. I just kind of did it. But the real commitment came to moving to L.A. Because I was doing fine in Chicago. I was doing theater, and I could do little movies, I did Thief, I did little things, I came out, I did a little sitcom, I went back. And my uh, wife at the time, or girl, girlfriend, then she became my wife, uh, said, what is it that you want to do, Joe? I said, well, I want to be in movies. She goes, well, where do they make movies? I said, L.A. I'm not going to go to L.A. I don't need to go to L.A. I can do it from here. She goes, well, why don't you go rent a place for one year and then come back? You know, I can do that. That's like being on the road. And then I never came back. And that was when my career changed, was the commitment. So that's when it happened, 86. That was a commitment to go for it. This is from Sam Levine. Where are you, Sam? Here? Oh, here, yeah. okay. Well, Sam, in absentia, I'll ask you a question. What is the biggest blunder you've made in an audition? What is the most important lesson you learned in an audition? <laughs> I wanted to play Al Capone in The Untouchables. Huh. I wanted it. <laughs> I'm from Chicago. I am I'm going to play Al Capone in The Untouchables with Brian De Palma directing. And I fought my agency and get me in that goddamn room and I am going to get Al Capone. <laughs> And I slicked back my hair, I had my gray suit, and uh, I go, did you get any feedback? Yes. Well, what did he say? He goes, what the hell was he doing? <laughs> <laughs> I was so bad, I was so off, and every time I see you with the narrow plane, <laughs> I'm like, oh God, I was, I was so out of my mind. I was so <laughs> Your bravado bullshit. You know. That was the worst. Do you still have to audition? Yes, uh, I do. Uh, from time to time, you do. Yeah, that's not a problem for me. I like it. I go and it's just, I just take it. I usually get everything I audition for because I just eat the room alive. The last audition I had was for David Lynch. I didn't know it was for David Lynch. They said, this is a secret project, and they, they want to meet with you. And I said, okay, well, what's the character? I don't know. I said, well, I don't want to, what am I going to do if I don't know? They just, they just want to talk to you and videotape you. Said, All right. So I had just come from a funeral. I was in a suit. So I was in my body at that, that point. And I just talked for 15 minutes, and then I got a call. I'm doing this David Lynch thing. I'm like, okay, cool. But yeah, I've read. Yeah, you just, you just, I read for a Woody. That was just like, there's this part in Woody Allen movie. The description is a Harry Brock type. Yeah. Okay, Harry Brock isn't born yesterday. I just did it on Broadway. I am Harry Brock. Get me in the goddamn meeting, you know. Well, the cast agent, blah, 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 cast agent. So she, he just got pressing and showed all these little clips of me and these little independent movies to show that I, I'm an actor, not just a, you know. And then out of the blue, I'm in the top five. And I went, oh, fuck, that means John Goodman's going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> Beats me out of everything. You know? <laughs> a great guy and a good actor and a friend. But... <laughs> then all of a sudden I get a call to go to fly down to New York. I was in Martha's Vineyard. I rented a little plane. I went down. You're going to meet Woody Allen at 1.30. Uh, the casting director is going to meet you uh, outside the door. She's going to give you the pages. You're going to walk in. You're going to shake Woody's hand. He's going to talk to you for one minute, maybe one minute, 30 seconds. Then you'll have 15 minutes in the lobby with the script. Uh, to work on it, then you'll come and read. Oh my God. 
I walked in and I made a real conscious effort not to call him Mr. Allen or Sir. I want to talk to him like a person. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Jim. And I nice meet you, nice to meet you. And he started to describe the character a little bit like this. Nice, kind of like a Harry Brock type. Yeah, yeah, he's got the volatility of that, but not necessarily. I don't want shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I went out, and I went out, and I read the script, and I had Paul Haggis on the line. I said, because, I said, Paul, you're going to have to help me, man. In this 15 minutes, I don't know what the fuck to do. I need some coaching. So I didn't call him. I read it, and I went, oh, I got this. I read it out loud. Hey, I got this. I read it out loud. Oh, yeah, this is mine. I walked in in 10 minutes. I sat down, I read the script with the, the casting girl, and I did a beautiful job. And he goes, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, this is very terrible of me. It's just, this, is very, this is not, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm I, I hate to tell an actor what to do because I don't really, I don't know really how to communicate with the, right with the uh, actors. So, so, I mean, I'm an actor, but I, I, I don't know what to say. You know, and I'm going, this guy's got Academy Awards for directing. I don't want to say that I'm an actor, right? But I just want to give you, I'd like you to do it one more time. I'd like to give you one note. I don't know if it's going to make sense to you or not. And I don't mean to take offense to it or anything like that. But, but it, it's just maybe, maybe you'll understand it. I went, okay, what? He goes, can you do it stupider? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what he was talking about was status. I was playing the character at my status. Of you translated the note to something you could play. Yeah, it's just all I had to do was bring his, you know, I mean, I had that trouble on According to Jim. I'd argue with the writers about stuff. And he went, Jim, that's you. That's your intelligence because you've gone through so much and you are, you have the insight. But this gym doesn't have that insight. Back to and I went, yeah, you're right, you're right. So I gotta bring that, I gotta go back down to lower status, but still have the time to tell And then I got the part, yeah. But that what that's just an important thing because you didn't just go, oh, okay, don't. You really thought, who am I then? And how can I connect to that? Right. I was bring well, because the first thing you do is you bring out what you feel. How do I connect with the guy? So now, how I connect with the guy, I bring out those feelings, but I'm bringing them out as Jim. And what he did was say, okay, now put it in a character. And then I had to go to all my working class jobs and go and realize all the guys I was talking to. And, and I went, oh, I don't know what this guy is. And so I dropped you connected here. Yeah. Within, within 15 seconds. I heard a great story. Pitcher. Right? I met this pitcher. He had a big ring. Right? Uh, he won the World Series, right? I think it was Tampa or the Marlins or somebody. I met him at a party and he goes, you know, everybody asked me who was the toughest batter I ever pitched against. He goes, everybody asked that question. And it's like, man, some days the batter is good, some days he's not. It's, he goes, I'll tell you the toughest thing. It's this moment. <laughs> <laughs> He says, from this chin point to here, I have 30 seconds to recover. 30 seconds to recover. He goes, that could have been the winning run. That could have been a run that, that just tied us up or the go-ahead run. And he goes, I have to recover and get full focus in 30 seconds. Now, I related to that as an actor. It's like recover, 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 recover. Somebody upsets you, something happens on the set, and you go recover, 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 recover. 30 seconds. Okay, let's do the scene again. That's because if you hang on to the mistake, you cause the next mistake. Woo, you do. And it parlays. Yeah. That's great advice. Thank you. Uh, please like our page, please share it. We're taking questions from the live audience and also from Facebook. This is from Christine. Are you here? Okay, right there. Uh, looking for stories from Only the Lonely about John Candy or Maureen O'Hara. Uh, John Candy was, uh, he was the original Joy Boy. The Joy Boy. John Candy was the most wonderful 
one of the most wonderful men I have ever met. Played with him. We played together. I mean, he's a goofy, funny son of a bitch. He's the only one who's ever made me pee my pants. <laughs> but literally, at Saturday Night Live, I mean, uh, don't get me going on candy, because I love him more than anything on earth. That was a Paul Bear. I mean, I mean, you know, he was he was a beautiful, beautiful man. Talk about sharing, giving, loving. He was, uh, I can tell you one story about Maureen O'Hare about that thing. I mean, I got 60 of them, but there, Maureen O'Hare, you know who she is? She was, you know, the, the redhead Duke's girl, right? In the quiet, quiet front or quiet, what? Quiet man. Quiet man. And uh, so what they're doing is what she, they pull her out of retirement. She hadn't done anything for 17 years, but John got her to do it. So now we're on, we're on Wabash in Chicago, underneath the L, and Johnny's got this two T-ton trailer, you know, two pop-outs with the kitchen in. You know, it's like, it's like Palace, like Johnny goes, yeah, well, I'm a big guy, I need a big trailer. <laughs> well, he saw Marino here walk onto the street into her trailer, and it was this little trailer. <sighs> Got the producers, and he said, "No, no, no. This is a this is Marino Heron. This is this is Duke's girl. Okay, you, you can't put her in a trailer like that. I can't, I can't be in this and have Marino have being in that in that trailer. You got to get her a better trailer." And they're going, "Well, John, we're trying to save money for the screen. You know, it's a tight budget, and we want to make sure we got enough money for the screen to put on the screen." It was okay. Give her my trailer. And I'll take the honey wagon. You know what a honey wagon is? <laughs> you know, the stairs go up and a thin, a little place to pee, a little mirror, and a little couch that you can barely take a nap on. So here's Candy, sitting with his little buddy Frankie, who you couldn't see, <laughs> right? Because John was so big. I walked by, and he was sitting on the end of the door open, smoking a cigarette. Like, hey, Jimmy, how you doing? I said, Johnny, what are you doing here? Ah, oh, this is great. I love this trailer. I love it. They go, say hi to Frankie. And he'd lean back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jimmy. Hey, Frankie. <laughs> and he would, they would call him the set, and he would get out, let's go sideways, get out, and the whole honey wagon would go like this. <laughs> Producers come and go, Hey, John, we found the money. We, we found the money to get Maureen <laughs> a trailer. Are you sure? Because I don't want to blow it. I don't want to hurt the film. Are you sure you got enough money for a bigger trailer? Yes. Okay, great. He got her a nice trailer. He was just uh, he's the sweetest guy in the world. I love him. I did Saturday Night Live for the first time. My brother just died like a year and a half, two years before that. Me coming on Saturday Night Live was like such a weird thing. It was pure denial. That's the only way I got on that show. And, uh, I mean, Brandon Tartikoff thought I was right for it and he put me on it. But uh, just the pressure of John and, you know, who he was and me and a brother and all, you know, all that kind of psychological drama. And guess who the first host is? John Candy. <laughs> he comes down on Monday and, uh, you know, uh, let's get something to eat. Oh no, Jimmy, I'm on a, I'm on a uh, diet. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not on a diet. I'm not on a diet. I'm on a lifestyle change. <laughs> you know, because when you diet, you you die. But lifestyle is just eat, eating a little different. You know, I don't eat the, the lasagna anymore. You know, bullshit. <laughs> anyway, he goes, "What do you want to do?" And I said, well, "John, you're the host. It's what do you want to do?" And he goes, "Jimmy." This is your first show. What do you want to do? I said, well, I'd like to do Mr. Mambo. I did six scenes with him on the first show that I did because Johnny insisted on it. And we'd sit in this room and he would go crazy with characters and we would laugh. That's when I peed myself. Eating corned beef sandwiches like this from the Carnegie Deli. Yeah, lifestyle. Yeah, lifestyle, John. I'm sorry to go on, but I don't know. Those are great. Do we want to hear them? Is working on sketch comedy different than working on scripted comedy? Yeah. 
Yes, it is. I mean, it's still a script. It's just the, uh, you know, a, a longer script. You have more of a trajectory in the character, and you want to, where's your character at that time? And you haven't seen him for a while. And where is he at then? And what has happened? And what would happen if this character didn't exist in the play or the movie uh, to show what your value is? And, you know. A sketch, you're just trying to get some laughs. You know, it's higher energy, it's faster, you know, it's characters are a little bigger. Uh, they still have to be grounded, but they're just a little bigger. And do you keep more of an ear to the audience? I the always family? keep an ear to the audience. <laughs> I always got an ear to the audience. That's what that Second City did. Improvising in front of an audience, you're writing, you're directing, you're listening to the piano player. You're listening to the audience literally breathing. Because with comedy, when somebody laughs hard, they exhale. And when they exhale, they have to bring the air in. And if you short them a little bit, you give them another laugh, before they get that full breath, you get another laugh on them, you can keep them going. And then you give them a break. You'll see stand up do it, all of a sudden they'll just stop. And then they'll start the new beat. But once they got them, they get beat. They cut their breathing off. So all that shit's going on while you're still trying to do the character. So that training is, you know, it's a detriment in real life, but in acting, it's great. But that ability to improvise has helped you at auditions as well. Improvising is, like my daughter, again, she's doing this tissue thing. She's really good. She's got some old soul that freaks me out. <laughs> but the note she keeps getting is, why don't you have some fun with this? You know, what did you say, shaped? Pre-shaped. Pre She's doing that pre-shaped stuff. L loosen up, have some fun. And I told her, I said, darling, you gotta take some S you know, Second City classes. You gotta know what it feels like to have fun. And then you can transfer that into scripted material. Me, I, I, I that was where I was raised. So I can transfer a piece of fun to anything. So, you know, you gotta kinda, improvising is very important to know the feeling of spontaneity, the feeling, so you can you can do it. It's like, uh, you know, uh, the, my bishop said to me, Jim, you have to forgive people, you have to forgive people. It's very important for you to forgive people. Because you have to understand the feeling of forgiveness, of what it feels like to forgive somebody. And when you understand that feeling, only then will you be able to forgive yourself. So I do the same thing. It's like you have to improvise in front of an audience to understand that feeling of fun, of really depending on the love across from you and being vulnerable to that, and then you can transfer to anything. How do you handle doing eight shows a week on Broadway and keeping it fresh? Well, don't get drunk. <laughs> uh, don't get high. You know, that's where the word craft comes. Me, at, at three months, I'm done. I did Pirates of Penzance on the road, and then on Broadway for a year. And at three months, I could not, I could not shave another beat. I could not get another laugh out of it. The character was full. Every movement was, it was like a streetcar. Was, you, you could see it. You can see he had every, he worked it all out on stage. At three months, I'm like, I'm done. So I don't know how. It's really hard. Eight shows is really hard. My brother John told me that one time. He goes, when you do eight shows a week, he said, that's all you do. That's just all you do. You get up late. You read the paper. You have a little breakfast. You do some stupid little shopping. You go take a nap. You eat protein and some carbs before the show. You start gearing yourself up. You do your vocal warm-up. You have half hour. You are stretching. You 
get a sweat before you get on stage. You are hot like a hockey player. And then you just gotta do that routine every day and routine will bring. But uh, keep it fresh. I mean, the way I keep it fresh is I have to live a little bit. But they don't really like that in Broadway. <laughs> no, they don't like that, man. I get these fucking three by five cards from the stage manager every oh, day. God. Was like, <laughs> no, this, this two words here are different than the script. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot. I'm so sorry. <laughs> God, if something happens on the set that you can't avoid, you get to improvise around it, you know? But they're, 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 they are, Broadway is fucking clockwork. Once you lock that, once opening night happens, it is locked. And you cannot do anything different. They don't want you to do anything different unless the director comes and sees it and discusses it and it's approved and the stage manager can make the change. Because they're watching every movie you make. They're like, you know, the bailiffs in court or something. <laughs> it felt very, very, you know, hot. <laughs> It was hard. It was hard, bro. It was hard. We're in the final home stretch here. Taking questions from Facebook, like our page, share our page. This is from Ian. You mentioned dancing and music several times today. Can you talk about how an actor can fill their life with experiences other than acting and more about what you do that keeps life fresh for you? Anybody see that Gary Shanley documentary? Mm -hmm. I oh. worked with Gary for so many years. You saw it? No, I can't watch it. You know, don't, don't. Uh, it is a beautiful love letter from Judd Apatow to Gary. And we know Gary. Yes. Uh, what was the question again? Uh, how, how do you keep with music? There was a quote the in there. There was a quote in there from Jay Leno that haunted me. It's still haunting me. Uh, he said, you know, you got to look at show business. You got to treat show business like a hooker. You got to have a life. You can't get attached to it. You can't make show business your life because it will leave you and elude you. You've got to have a life. You know, it's like a hooker. It's just a temporary thing. It's like you move on, you don't get attached. And Gary, more so than me, it just that was his life. And you watch the, the struggle because of it. So I say do anything. Have a life, have a family, have a hobby, collect uh, butterflies, uh, <laughs> hike. Uh, uh, get a job that you always wanted to do or you know have a life don't I mean there's a there's a thing about I mean I'm just an aggressive son of a bitch and it's all I wanted single focus and I did it you know but you know now I'm like in my 60s and I'm like I look around and I thank God I have some children you know I've created some life and I've created a band and I've created other things but you know I'm still married to show business and it breaks my heart you know all the time. I don't know what to do. I just, something. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Gary Shambling Judd Epitel story, actually. During all the years that I worked with him on the Larry Sanders show, I, I'm in Gary's office, and Judd Apatow walks in, and Gary says, Howard, this is Judd Apatow. And Judd says, oh, we've met. And I could tell from the tone of voice that something... You negative, yelled at him in a room, didn't you? <laughs> I'm like, something negative is about to happen. And so, oh, we have. And he said, yes, uh, when I first got to town, I wanted to be an actor. And an agent sent me to you for an evaluation. So I guess I have you to thank for my writing career. Oh, yes! <laughs> and Gary said, don't you just want to crawl in that picture? Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> By the way, you delivered it right. He's, he, 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 I think you did the right thing for him. Look at what he's done with that right. Can't argue with his success for him. Yeah. Uh, this is from Facebook. Have nerves changed you? How do you handle nerves as an experienced actor? Uh, you you got to, you know, it's the same thing as uh, 
any situation in life, you know, the best thing to do when you have nerves, it means you're, well, there's two ways to look at it. The feeling of nervousness is the same feeling as excitement. It's like I went to a shrink one time when I was doing Saturday Night Live. And she said, well, what do you do, you know, what do you do after the show? I said, well, well, it's a bad show. I'm not in it much. I go to the party and I drink a lot. And then about 4.30 in the morning, I take a Valium. And I sit in the bathtub. Then I go to sleep. And then I wake up around 2. And then I walk around Greenwich Village and maybe get something to eat. And she goes, well, what do you do when you have a good show? Oh! I go, I go to the party, and I drink a lot. You know, and I come home, and I take a Valium, you know, and I take a bath to calm down, and I go to sleep, and I wake up. And then uh, and I walk around the village. And I went, that sounds so fucking weird. She said, same. She does the same thing to your body. This kind of depressed thing, or this excitement, this nervous thing, or excitement. So I just try to switch it, like with Jamie, who's very anxious, like, I go, she goes, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous. I said, no, 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 you're so excited. It's the same feeling. You're excited to show your wares. You're excited to perform. That's what you're feeling. It's not scared that you're gonna fail. It's excitement to show everybody how good you are. So that's one way, it's a perception change. But the other way is just physicality. You know, I mean, it's as basic as yoga or meditation. Uh, you've got to go back to your breathing, you got to go back to your body, you got to go back to your heart, back to your heart. Whatever brings you to your heart, that's what you do. And the more physical you are, your heart starts to beat. You can actually hear it. All of a sudden, now I'm connecting to the physical part. I'm visualizing my heart. I'm in my body. I'm, I'm like, let's be present in my body. Heart, heart, love, 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 heart, heart, heart. And then just try to stay there as long as you can. And then, you know, Hopefully, you're practiced enough that where when you get on stage, instinct takes over for you and you get to write it. Is there anything we haven't covered that you want to leave people with or share? Well, You know, my, my brother, when he passed away, we buried him in uh, Chilmark. And it was like three little roads up and in the middle. And there was no marker yet, right? And everybody came to this little cemetery, this little village to visit, you know, pay their respect. But they couldn't find him. And so they're driving all through the cemetery. And he's Poor people in the town were like freaking out of all the traffic and people. And they came and they approached us and they said, look, we'll give you six cemetery plots at the front, put a fence around it. So when people want to come and visit and honor your brother, it's right there. So they won't disturb everything. It's a long story, I'm sorry. No, please tell them. And, and it won't disturb anything. So, uh, you know, Judy and I talked about it and said, you know, why don't we do that? So we went to the funeral director, who was the original guy, and he said, okay, well, this is how we're gonna zoom the body and move, put a new vault in and you know, drop it down. And he said, uh, I said, well, all right, when are you gonna do it? You know, we'll do it on Wednesday at one o'clock. All right, I'll be there. Oh, Mr. Belushi. This is a this is a terrible business. You don't want to be there. You scared the fuck out of me. <laughs> and sure enough, car went over it, cracked the vault, oxygen got in, and apparently there was some decay or whatever. And he had to literally take John out and put him in a coffin and, and move him. And I was so glad I wasn't there to see that. <laughs> So I'll leave you with this. This profession is a terrible profession. <laughs> <laughs> It'll break your heart. You'll see things that you should never see. 
you know, you know, it's 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 a, it's doesn't change. I told my daughter that. I said you could have been anything, honey. You didn't have to do this acting thing. It doesn't get any better. It just you get heartbreak sometimes if you're sensitive, and we wouldn't be here if we weren't sensitive. So you get hurt a lot. So recover. <laughs> and on that note, recover. Recover. <laughs>